Ladies and gentlemen, transmitting direct from Lion's Den Studios in Los Angeles, California, Crew S Studios and Danube Productions bring you The Conduit. Bringing together motivated artists to share their experience and to pull back the curtain for a first-hand look at a life in the arts. Today our guest is Z-Trip, ace DJ for LL Cool J, the godfather of the mashup and go-to remix producer. So adjust your antenna, relax, and tune in. The program is about to begin. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Dan Ubik. Welcome to episode 7 of The Conduit, a podcast where I sit down and talk to amazing, courageous people about making a living in the arts. Today my guest is globetrotting DJ and producer Z Trip, recipient of America's Best DJ Award. Zach has been called the godfather of mashups and has collaborated with everyone from Nas, LO Cool J, Public Enemy, Rakim, and Talib Kweli to folks like Bass Nectar, Chester Bennington, RIP, Shepard Ferry, and DJ Shadow. His love for all styles of music and how they can work together is groundbreaking and inspiring and his innate funkiness and technical ability has led to composing score for video games like EA's Skate and Madden games, mashups for Activision's DJ Hero, and scoring music for films such as Infamy, La Bar, Scratch All The Way Live, and Bob Marley, Legend Remixed. In addition, Zach has done remixes for everyone from Nirvana, The Beastie Boys, Dead Weather, and The Jackson 5. Zach's work ethic is to be admired, as is his love of music, approachable demeanor, and positive attitude. So sit back, relax, and have a listen to my conversation with my brother and ace DJ, Z Trip. Zach, Z Trip, welcome to The Conduit, man. Thanks so much for being here. I'm stoked to be here, man. How are you, Dan? Oh, I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm so, uh, I've known you for a while, but uh, doing my homework on you and finding out all kinds of amazing facts that I didn't know either. So uh, excited to dig in and uh, share all your history and uh, and uh, just how you got to where you are with all of our listeners, man. So appreciate you being here, dude. Stoked to be here. So you grew up in Queens in New York and then moved out to Phoenix, Arizona as a teenager. Uh, did either city have a big effect on what music was inspiring you as a kid? They both did actually for, for very polar opposite reasons. Um, yeah. you know, obviously picking up everything that was happening with hip hop in New York. I mean, that was like, you know, early eighties, 84, 85, 86, um, where I was buying hip hop records in New York yeah regional records things that you know you couldn't really find anywhere else um and bringing them back to arizona so to preface that my uh i moved out from queens originally as a kid my parents got a divorce my dad moved back to new york so then i was back and forth so there was this yeah. thing of like i'd go to new york get all this music get all this culture go back to arizona and we lived <laughs> um 20 miles outside of of the city line of phoenix so it's rural you know closest neighbor was a mile away dirt roads like real sure. went from having the the long island railroad in my backyard in new york to cattle <laughs> and like saguaro <laughs> cactuses and shit so yep. i'm bringing this hip-hop to there and right. um exposing all my friends and all these people who didn't know what any of this music was um to this stuff that was like bleeding edge happening like here's i just got this epmd 12 inch that came out you know a week ago <laughs> right that kind of thing so it was um so basically having two worlds that i was living in this real rural sort of country very rock heavy very yeah. didn't really have any uh any sort of urban flavor at all um it was kind of the that i think that's why i had a good balance of like i knew all the rock shit my brother was also into rock and and he yeah. was into, you know, uh, Kiss and ACDC and Deep Purple, and Black Sabbath and Pink Floyd and Zeppelin, on and on and on. So um, here I was bringing Curtis Blow and Nucleus and yeah, there you go. I know that <laughs> record well. Um, <laughs> yep. But, you know, bringing in, you know, Run DMC and UTFO and LL Cool J and, you know, all this this stuff into that. And, and me being a drummer and being yeah. based around drums and beats. All of that to me 
made sense. So when I heard this really rhythmic, you know, heavy music, I was just immediately drawn to it. But that was what I was trying to sort of show to all my friends who were like big, you know, John Bonham fans and loved Led Zeppelin. I was like, if you like this, you're going to love this. And right. some got it, some didn't, some got it way later. <laughs> some still don't get it. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, right. so. But yeah, that's crazy. man. What did, how did your, I I read too, that your mom played guitar and sang and played keys and stuff. How did, what did she think of hip hop music? Did she like it? Did she like rap music? She, she, I think she dug, she dug the rhythm, you know, she, she dug, she understood, I think the, the core of what drew me to it. Um, but I, I don't think she ever really tapped into what, you know, any of the social or any of the, you know, the wordplay or any of that stuff. I I think it was just on the surface. She's like, oh yeah beats he likes to dance he likes drums and so she understood sort of the you know the baseline of what it was but she encouraged it i mean she you know but also you know it wasn't like i just listened to to hip-hop i listened to everything and yeah it just happened to be that hip-hop was the thing that i was the most drawn to because it was the newest thing and was was developing before my eyes where i had all this catalog to look at yeah with zeppelin and pink floyd and everything i I had years to study up and even going back and you know uh and and diversifying too like you know as much as there was led zeppelin there was also parliament and james brown and the b-52s and like it it was and the beatles and joan baez and just i mean it was there was so much music and different textures to to understand and and um my mom playing guitar and uh and singing and my sister sang a little bit my mom played keys so there was always you know, we were, we grew up very hippie community. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, so there's a lot of potlucks at the house, a lot of, <laughs> uh, a lot of hippies hanging around, a lot of sing-alongs, a lot of, you know, interesting yeah. smells <laughs> right. as a kid walking around, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, so, but it was, uh, I think all that lent to my ability to absorb and just see like different styles and cultures and ethnicities and food and music. And, and I, I was glad that I was experiencing all that, but it was also really difficult because in Arizona at the time, there weren't a lot of those people around, you know what I mean? Right. So, uh, it was a little tough to, um, I think our family was trying to find other like-minded people. So, you know, it took a little sure. finding, but we found them. She right, man. You always do. We find our tribe, man. Yeah, true. Dang. Well, so you're buying all these records and bringing them home and playing for people, playing them for people in, in, uh, in Arizona. How did you, what kind of clicked with you as far as like, uh, seeing the DJ behind all these MCs and knowing that you could put these records that you've been buying to work? Well, that was, um, the, the DJ part came, uh, you know, later, but not much later. I mean, it was, it was like, I was exposed to this stuff and I was like, this is incredible. But I think when I started, so the whole thing of me becoming a DJ, the whole sort of premise of that was that I was buying these 12 inch records because I would hear this music and I would hear snippets of it because people were mixing and I'd yeah. be like, that, what was that? And they only played yeah. it for like a minute. And I would like, I want more of that. Where can I find yeah. it? So I would then go find the, the, you know, the, the single or the album and maybe it only had the album only had the, the album track. But then I'd go look into the 12-inch single area and I would find that they had the 12-inch with an extended version, a dub version, a uh, remix. you know, a remix version. So I was like, what? There's five versions of my favorite song? I need <laughs> right. to buy this. Like, this is right. like the album is whatever. This is what I came here for. So, yeah, my, my collection was growing and growing and growing. And after a while, uh, you know, half a crate turned into three crates, turned into five crates of these 12 inch singles that I had. And, you know, then friends were like, Hey, you should come over and bring your record collection, play your records at our party. And, you know, I'd, I'd trying to put together mixtape yeah. stuff. And it wasn't really like I set out to become a DJ. I really just, uh, it was very much about me having this music and wanting to share it. And so once I realized that I could yeah. put it together and I could, I could expose people to the things that I liked. The DJ thing came into play, and then I started right. seeing how other DJs did it. And I think one of my first um, people that I really, really studied was Marley Mall and Red Alert. Actually, at the same time, because they both had competing 
mix shows on in New York at the same time. Marley Mall yeah. on West, WBLS, and Red Alert on Kiss FM. And they both yeah. came on at the same time from nine to midnight. So you'd have to have yeah. two cassette players recording each show so you <laughs> right. could listen to both the following day um or the following you know couple days because they would do it on the weekends and um so you'd wait for the weekends you'd record the shows and then all week you'd listen to pick up stuff and and then you'd run to the record store and be like hey do you have this you know yeah oh that's uh, great so yeah that's that's kind of how it, it happened like i, I literally it, it literally was just from me collecting records and wanting to share those records with with other people that I realized I need to string these records together in a way that I'm hearing other DJs and people do that. And in doing that, I also started to figure out how to infuse things that I that they weren't playing and put them in yeah. like, you know, let me see if I can put a Led Zeppelin in. Let me see if I can put a Pink Floyd in. Let me see, you know, because I love some of these songs too. They're funky or they're or the heavy and the intensity was kind of what I was trying to match. And I didn't really see a, a a difference between the two. I mean, sonically, clearly there is, and stylistically, yeah. but energy-wise, you know, the immigrant song is just as heavy as as um, jam on it to me. It has the same yeah. intensity, yeah. or bring the noise has the same intensity. So that yeah. you know, trying to find the similar similar songs, and then along comes Rick Rubin and sort of proves my my feeling in yeah. uh you know in context and um yeah. yeah so that was it but you know i Rock grown Fox up and all those early songs yeah. with some heavy guitar and sample and then aerosmith and all that yeah growing up in, in that and you know it, you i listened to both and i hung out with both crowds and i i didn't really i understood there was a difference but i didn't give a fuck <laughs> it was like yeah i i want to i want to know both of these worlds and both of these worlds have incredible culture and people and stories and the fact that they don't speak to each other is really weird to me so yeah. because both of them spoke to me but i realized that yeah. both of them didn't speak to everybody else so i was like i, I gotta <laughs> right i gotta get people on board because that's that's really the whole deal that's it that's like junior high for me in los angeles is like everybody coming together with busing you know and you're getting all these different cultures and musics and that was the beautiful thing about it, like, you know, you're finding out about EPMD and Run DMC and Slayer and, and freaking Maiden, Metallica, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's like, whatever it is, you know, that, it was, it was it is, a great time. Energy and sharing energy is like the most important thing. You know, if you can, if you can get that energy onto vinyl or onto whatever format it is now, you know, and yeah. share that energy, that's what's infectious. Yeah. And when the, when people did it right, it was like, a win for the cause you know what i mean i felt so you know when you hear on ryman and steel and you hear when the levy breaks drum break and you're like yeah this is it this is what i'm talking about you know what i mean and then you yeah. know later on walk this way or you know right. even even um sampling slayer for you know for uh, on a public enemy song i was like zero yeah you know what one of my favorites is and and i i for many reasons um is rock the bells rock the bells oh, yeah. to me was it, it's sort of a case study if you will on using something that felt right for the song but yeah. also using something you know we get locked into sampling of like i gotta go find something old and dirty mm -hmm. and and you know a, a, a something from the 60s or 70s at the yeah. time that rock the bells was made the guitar stab the blah, which is the the heartbeat of that song yeah is a, a guitar riff from acdc uh um, yeah. and from uh, this album flick of the switch and that album had just come out so right right the idea that they're working on the song and rick rubin goes over to his record that he just probably got and i was like well i need yeah. something heavy let me grab this angus young rah, puts it on the thing and it becomes what it becomes is the epitome of sort of punk rock no rules just do what feels right and it, that to me is i i subscribe to that as much as yeah. i subscribe to sampling james brown records and everything else i thought that was you know eric b and rakim you know i know you got soul and you know on and on and marley and all these people who are just incredible you know producers paul c yeah. whatever that were sampling these you know doing this great great work 
Um, I still love the fact that as much as that was becoming a sound and a thing, here's this thing that is just like, I'm going to take that. That came out yesterday. Fuck it. It works. I'm taking it. Yeah. I love that. (laughs) Right. That to me was, was, um, was a thing that spoke to me that there are no rules. And when, you know, when you're thinking about the people who kind of laid the groundwork, you know, the, the cool Herx and Bambadas and Jazzy J's of the world and flash of, you know, these guys who were taking craft work, for example, that's a German right. electronic group that has had really had nothing to do with hip hop really, but because yeah. Bambada took it and put it into the mix and put it in the juxtaposition of a couple things, all of a sudden these kids who would not have known about that are hearing it going, what is that? Now all of a sudden yeah. it becomes an anthem and you've got this German, you know, electronic act, very alternative, yeah. very avant-garde is now a staple in the hip hop diet, like in the diagram, you know what I mean? It's like craft work. Totally. So I loved that. And I still, I think that, that, blueprint was embedded in my dna at an early age and when trends started happening i started becoming less excited about whatever the trend was and more wanting to go down the path of like let's keep pushing these boundaries and seeing yeah. producers like timberland and uh, and all these guys doing sampling middle eastern records and and like just right. let's keep pushing this because it doesn't always have to be the same thing you know what i mean and um Ooh. people get really caught up in in what sells or what's hot and i feel like yeah that's great you can chase the money but like creatively make something that's going to stand the test of time and that's kind of what i felt yeah. like um yeah those a, boundary a, a, pushing to ones me. are the ones that catch your ear too yeah. like nas yeah. and damien with that with the uh, mulatu sample like that mm-hmm. was like fuck that was like the best single that year it was incredible right right I love that stuff. I love when people push boundaries. And to me, that's the thing that's always attracted to, you know, me to hip hop is that there was a sense of sampling and discovery. And, you know, I always call it like the prism, like, you know, there was a time where hip hop, anything that came into hip hop could be diffused into the, and and the rainbow shoots out, right? It's like anything, but it wouldn't work the other way around. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's like trying to get like, it was very hard to get a, a rock or a country or jazz or anything to do hip hop because it wasn't, it just, it was like them trying to do like, that's why you saw all the commercials, like the Flintstones rapping or whatever the fuck, you know, bullshit, like everybody trying to hip hop because that was hot and they were trying right. to co-opt that into you know, the culture, but like it only kind of worked one way for a very long time. And I'm kind of grateful for that because it honed it and it made it a very specific thing that if you wanted to obtain that, you had to kind of go to the culture. You couldn't just, you know, bite off of it. And then eventually people kind of figured out how to do that with, um, you know, all the, all the nonsense that happened after that. But, um, there was a time (laughs) where it was like, you know, it, the, it was a very much a one way street and I was fully down that street. Yeah, man. That was the thing that drew me in too. It was just like, I mean, De La, of course, their first record, like sampling How High Is The Water Mama from Johnny Cash and then like bringing in some reggae's, like like reggae uh, samples and some some funk samples. It was like, dang, every kind of music I like is in this is on this record, you know? Yeah. Sampled yeah. or there's a nod to it from there, you know? It's funny, man. To me, like all Incredible. the early all the early hip hoppers that I had met were just freaks yeah. we were all just you know freaks that were just kind of outcasts <laughs> from the from the norm and you know yeah people walking around with you know feathers in their hair or hair all disheveled or you know like looking slick looking fine <laughs> or looking like you just you know came out of the out of the dumps man it's like it didn't fucking matter like that we would all white black Asian didn't fucking matter, yep. you know, Puerto Rican. And I, I, I noticed that mostly with, with graffiti writers. So before I even got into any of the music, really, I was messing yeah. around with graffiti and there was, you know, you'd have these crews of people that would hang out and the thing that bonded them was the art and you'd look at them and they'd yeah. all be of different size, shape, 
girl, guy, ethnicity, right. rich, poor. It didn't, you know, if you had skills, you had skills. And that's what we judged you on was like, sure. That person's the dopest person, you know? So, yeah. um, I loved that you, you know, it was the epitome of you couldn't judge a book by its cover. And, you know, sometimes the, the, you know, especially you'd see it in like b-boy events or, you know, you, you know, see some b-boy or some b-girl come out and they, they just look like they just got off the bus <laughs> somewhere, you know, who knows? And like all of a sudden and they just you shot, surprised. yo, they just <laughs> burn the whole fucking place down. You're like, yep, yep. don't fucking, you know what I mean? Don't just because you, just because yeah, you, yeah, just because you look, the, just because you got the look, doesn't mean you got the flavor inside, man. Sometimes <laughs> the people who I don't even that. look at are the most fierce. So I, I love that shit, and I've, I've always been a fan. Um, and I feel like hip hop for me in the early days really taught me that, you know, um, there was none of that. There, you know, it was just skills over everything. You know, what I mean, yeah. so. That's that's it, man. Judge a person by the content of their character and what they can do, not everything yeah. else. Yeah, their their well, knowledge of music. <laughs> all this, stuff, yeah, exactly right. So all this stuff is inspiring you, and um, I want to lead us into you starting to produce and record your own stuff. And uh, how did you f just because I'm I'm trying to this podcast is all about kind of get, giving people the tools and the knowledge uh, from people who have lived it and done it. How how do we get into these places where we can make a living at music? So you're listening to Marley and Red Alert. And you're hearing all these great productions. You're you're loving all kinds of music from all kinds of genres that you're loving. How, what what gets you into wanting to produce your own stuff? And what are your first steps into producing your own stuff? The very first steps were um, were me making pause mixtapes. You know what right. I mean? Like that's <laughs> real rudimentary, but like it was the ability of I want to be able to create my own version of this. So mm -hmm. how do I extend this? Like this is my favorite part of the song. I want more of this. Yeah. So that became pause mixtapes and trying to extend it. Then once yeah. I actually got a sampler, actually turntables, then it was like I could do it manually. But if I wanted yeah. to loop something, it was like I need a machine that can do this. So um, mm -hmm. my first sampler was a was an EPS 16 plus the and Sonic. And um, mm -hmm. once I got that, I was off and running because I could then start putting together collages of things. It's like I've always wanted to put this beat with this guitar or this vocal thing. And so I started doing that. Then the next thing was a four track. So to right. be able to record, you know, let me lay the drums down or the loop down. Let me lay the vocal down. Um, and so that became a, a you know, a, a way to do it. And eventually over the years, fast forward to Pro Tools and having, you know, my first really raw digital, you know, audio workstation, I was able to start moving things around, you know what I mean? And, and the editing became um, one of my favorite things because then as a DJ, I could start making my own edits of things and making my own versions of things. And fast forward to now, that's commonplace. You could do all that shit on your phone, you know what I mean? There's, there's a million yeah. different ways to do it. Very cost effective. We used to have to go to uh, you know recording studios to do that. Um, if you want to, like, I always want to scratch my name. That was always like a goal. I want to be able to scratch my name. So yeah. the first time I was able to do that was um, taking uh, an acetate, you know, cutting a lacquer yep. eight times on on one side and then testing the first two to get the flavor right and then recording the next passes until you'd burn all of them. And hopefully you got, uh, you know, the good take. But it was very raw to do that, you know. And then there was a time too where, you know, if you really had budget, you could press your own records, but then you had to send away and they could get the thing back. So things yeah. that we can do now in 30 seconds would take us weeks, months. months. <laughs> um, and, uh, but you know, the thing is, it's all about trying to push the boundaries and trying to figure out how to evolve and sound different. And so, you know, I would apply all those things on mixtapes. Um, yeah. I started making mixtapes. I got, uh, my first time on wax was, um, on a series called, Return of the DJ that Bomb Records had put out, which is a magazine out of the Bay Area by David mm. Paul, black and mm -hmm. white graffiti hip hop magazine. And he was like, I'm going to do a album of all DJ cuts. Cause you know, back in the day, everybody had a DJ cut 
one yeah. song on the album where the DJ could get loose. He's like, I'm going to do a whole album of that and call it Return of the DJ. So he had hit me up about doing that. I did it. And then he did volume two, volume three. And I kept doing things. And on one of those, I did a song called Rockstar. And the whole point for me was to try and do a, um, a, a mix that was all rock based because I was like, all, I started realizing everyone's doing these hip hop DJ cuts, which is great, but like they're all the same flavor. So it was like, you know, vanilla, vanilla with almonds, mm -hmm. vanilla with chips, you know, Madagascar vanilla, you know, vanilla light, vanilla with almond. <laughs> it was like, okay, how do I throw, you know, pistachio in this motherfucker? Just, you know, what I mean, how can I just change it up? <laughs> so I, uh, I, I did a, a, a thing called um, Rockstar, and that caught the ear of a whole bunch of people. And it was all rock based stuff with hip hop in it, but it was sort of my version of that. And then, um, as you know, sort of simultaneously as that was happening, I was doing these mixes and, and being asked to do shows and start traveling a bit. And every time I would do a show, I'd always try and fuse in some rock or some just bugged out shit into my mix. Um, because I found that, yeah, there were other people who were in the party who would be like, I'd play for three or four hours and I might play um, a Van Halen song or something. Like that wasn't, you know, in a hip hop yep. thing, it's like, why, what? But the way I did it was clever enough where people yeah. would come up to me afterwards and be like, yo, that mix was incredible. That Van Halen thing you did? <laughs> and I was like, I just played for four hours and that's the thing that stuck out. So right. I started working on a mix um, and bumped into a, a, another DJ um, randomly at a rave named DJ P yeah. and asked him to do some, he was kind of doing some of the same flavor as, as I was. I was like, yo, we should do a mix together, collaborated, put out this thing called uneasy listening. And that, right. um, was all, you know, we called it blending. We were just blending acapellas and the weirdest juxtapositions. And it ended up yeah. becoming the, you know, the mashup thing, but we put that out and it cracked open all the doors. And then that, you know, I ended up getting signed off of that and put out my first album yeah. and really got serious about producing. Um, you know, the whole time I was trying to produce and make hip hop tracks or just tracks in general, but the DJ stuff was taking off. So these worlds, I was splitting these two worlds and um, it's just been kind of interesting because it's always been like that. Like the two worlds, they live together, but they're also completely different right, left brain um approaches but yeah. the fact that i've been able to straddle both and do both um i've been very lucky because they've opened up opportunities in both worlds yeah man well i love what you said about you know you were you were hearing how you wanted to blend things together and i think whether you're you know producing playing guitar and instruments or you're using samples and turntables either way the creative brain is like hearing things, you know, like a record and they're like, I like the drums on that, but I didn't really like the chords that they did. Or I like the vocals on that, but I think the drums could be better. Like trusting your inner instinct to like mash those things together is like, it paid off for you. Obviously you became kind of known for that. And, but I mean, in general, like Led Zeppelin taking like old, old blues songs and amping it up with, with a heavy drummer, you know, it's like, all of these things where you're mashing things together create something new and unique. And it's, it's a, uh, I think that's a great thing to follow in general. I, yeah, I mean, that was, like I said, that was the blueprint. I was hearing these DJs do that. Um, yeah. and was so inspired by it. I was like, yo, this is, I get it. You can take anything, but it has to go yeah. through this filter in order right. to make it better or or e evolve it not better because better you know some of these things are great as they are but having the ability to um sure to add to you know what i mean and 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 continue or expose people to something like you know how many times have i heard somebody do something and was like what the hell is that sample then i go back and i'm like oh that's a what bob james nautilus what the fuck is this you know what i mean or yeah. whatever yeah. And you just end up sort of like going down these roads so to me it's always been about incorporating as much as you can or being open to the, uh, the idea of, and never, you know, never turning something down just based on like, that's ah, not going to work. 
It's like, right. no, sometimes that's exactly what will work. And so, <laughs> right. and you know, you'll go through eight different attempts at things and be like, I'm so over this. And then you'll throw something in and be like, that's it. And you, yes. you know, for me, I think there's an internal threshold. There's like a filter like that. I just know if it hits me, I feel like other people are going to dig it because I, you know, over the years, it's like a blessing and a curse. I think like I have the, I, I'm, I, I have a hard sort of a threshold to hit in order for me to be stoked on something. And because there's just mm. so much out there and I only really want to play or, or, or listen to, or make music that I feel hits a certain thing like just to go and do like sometimes i'll get you know offered to do projects and i'll start you know in on them and i'm like this my heart's just not in this and there's just nothing i can't really do anything with this and i've done a few of those in the past but at some point i realized i could make money doing that but it doesn't fulfill the soul so i'm just gonna I'm going to pass on that i think i'm gonna just gonna do yeah. what i i want to do the inspiration so. has to be there has to like it, it's yeah. you know you can put out yeah, work man. but is well, it your best work right yeah right well so uneasy listening volume one is is doing well you're getting all these great reviews things are are happening um gigs are happening how did you kind of line up i mean this is the first time where you're as far as i know getting gigs to travel and all this stuff how did you line up all that stuff as someone new to it as far as getting an attorney to look over contracts for you getting a manager to help you book stuff all these things how did that all work out for well, someone who's I, um, doing that for the first time maybe yeah no it's uh you know i i was just sort of doing the work and just going 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 doing a lot of it myself you know, booking yeah. all the flights, traveling, figuring out, you know, didn't really know much about anything was just sort of fake it till you make it a little bit trying to figure out how to, right. how to evolve it. Um, yeah. I ended up, uh, speaking to a friend of mine who was working, um, at London, uh, full frequency recordings, uh, this girl, Alison Pember, who also had, was in charge of a, a magazine, um, up in, uh, Seattle and the Portland area. Um, and she, um, you know, she was working DJ shadows, you know, stuff and like was really entrenched in that. But her and I were speaking a little bit and she's like, I have a friend who was working at Warner brothers and I want you two to meet because I think you two could work well together. And I was kind of looking for somebody to help me navigate. And, um, I met Lori yeah. Bula who, um, we hit it off and had a great run. Um, she was my manager for 13 years and, yeah. um, but it was also sort of uncharted territory a little bit for her. Cause she was coming out of a, of, of a, of a, 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 a job at Warner brothers where she didn't want to be doing that anymore. She wanted to be managing. So we were kind of figuring it out together as we were going. And, gotcha. you know, that I think it, it, it was great for us because we got to learn a lot of things together and uh, some of the negatives, some of the positives, but you know, I yeah. think for anyone who's coming up, you know, finding somebody who's in your trajectory um, is crucial. I would say more so than finding somebody who's already established. Right. Um, I love the fact that she was, uh, she hadn't really done this much, you know, before mm. I love that she was a woman um, I loved that, uh, you know, that she had a lot of stuff stacked against her just like I did. Yeah. And I felt like if anyone's going to want this as much as I do, it's someone who fits this sort of, um, mold. And so we, you know, very grateful for the times that we worked together because we conquered a lot and we, we were hitting uncharted territory together. And also like the DJing thing you know, was also happening and being sort of in the right place at the right time with that led to more opportunities. And, um, mm. I think, you know, for anybody who's really sort of trying to figure out how to get into it, you know, getting down with the right, um, team, I think is crucial and yes. learning and, and being open to, uh, failing, being open to, 
um, being pushed out of out of comfort zones. Lori was really good about that. She she had pushed me completely out of my comfort zone many times, and while in the middle of it, I was probably protesting and like fighting it. You know what I mean? But I was like, <laughs> oh, I'll do yeah. it. It ended up yeah. being the best shit ever for me. Um, <laughs> right. And you know, there was there's something about having a, a partner in crime that is um, willing to. Um, you know, get you out of your comfort zone. Because if it's just you, I mean, I think it's probably the one thing I learned through the whole arc of my whole career is um, take chances, be risky, try to try to push boundaries, try to um, don't always play it safe. You know what I mean? And there's a time to play it safe. There's a time to lock in. And, you know, sometimes you get a gig where it's like, oh, this is a money gig. This is going to pay for all the other opportunities for me to do you know, to push my art. So I may have to lock into this thing, but learning the balance of that. But I, I feel like if you just stay with one thing and that's all you do, you run the risk of not being able to really grow um, yeah. as fast as you would if you didn't take chances. And you got to also know that you sometimes those chances do not pay off. <laughs> they right, do not right. pay and you fall <laughs> flat on your fucking face and that's uh you know the art of getting up and and dusting yourself off and being like Whoo, okay all limbs yeah. are here i'm still alive like yeah get up and keep you moving can't let it get you. lesson learned yeah you you you, you gotta yeah. i mean you know there's no golden ticket and there's no um you know you have to you have to go through all sorts of pitfalls um but yeah, getting the right team together, you know, I, you know, she had helped me get a lot of the right people in place. Um, and that helped propel me um, to where I needed to be, you know, coupled with also my work ethic was I'm here now. Like, it's, it's kind of like you get to a point where you're like, I'm here now. I got to really do the work. I, there's there's a line that I saw one day thumbing through VH1, the um, the TV show back when they were VH1, the TV show, yeah. uh, the, the, or <laughs> right. the not TV show, but the um, the network, and they were playing music related shows a lot. They'd have these bumpers of you know whatever so and so speaks on whatever. And I remember yeah. they had Ace Freely from Kiss yeah. um, on there for a second. It was some interview where um, they were asking him about making it, and they were like, "Hey, um, what does it take to make it?" And he's like, "Oh, well, first you got to get it was so good at your instrument." To the point where you, you know, you you eat, sleep, live with the instrument, learn it, learn it, learn it, get better than everybody else that you possibly know. You know, yeah. you have to turn away uh, it, girls, fun, partying, because you are dedicated to learning your craft. And then once you get really, really good, the best you could possibly be, then <laughs> you have to compete with all the other people who have done the same thing. And I was like, <laughs> yeah yeah that's kind of right because you gotta get really good and then you get into the pool with the rest of the yep. people who are that good or better than you and then you have to figure right. out how to go to the top of that so there's that level yeah. of like you know there, I, I always would joke around with like you know uh, friends of mine a lot of mcs back in the day would be like you know yo when i get signed dude i'm gonna fucking blah blah blah, blah. yo when i get signed i'm gonna blah, blah, blah. and it's like the the idea that that's the goal is like when I get signed, I've made it. Yeah. It's like, no, when right. you get signed, that's when you get to work again. That's right. That's right. It. So I feel like there's always a level of showing and proving um, every day, even to this day. Showing you know and what proving I mean? constantly, man. Constantly. You that's have it. to constantly, like every day, you're, you're, you know, every time you step up there and do whatever you're doing, every time you get in front of a camera or anytime you get in front of, you know, a crowd it's the first show every right. time. And, um, I think there's a level of not getting so caught up in the accolades and, or the, you know, uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I perspective really came to me a little bit later. Um, it was happening as I was evolving, but I, I would have to say like the biggest lessons and the biggest, um, amount of wisdom that I got from, my career and things that I could add to the, to bring to the table wisdom wise yeah. came through the pandemic. Mm. And I say that because I was 33 years of 
shows, 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 produce this, whatever, be there stuff. I constantly, you know, yeah. um, whether it was my stuff or over the last 11, 12 years, teaming up with LL and my stuff, there's yeah. these things of like, it was just go, 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 go. Balls to the wall, nonstop. Um, and I never took a break. So yeah. when the pandemic hit and all of a sudden I was home for more than three weeks at a, you know, and I was like, yo, I'm sleeping in my bed for a month, two months, <laughs> three months. <laughs> right. What the fuck is this? What, like, yeah. this is the best hotel I've ever stayed at. This is the coolest hotel. <laughs> All you my know, favorite records all are my, here. Do they? Whoever <laughs> figured this, they they know me. <laughs> so um, <laughs> when I when I finally had a minute to be with myself and with my thoughts and process everything, I kind of had a minute to yeah. stop and uh, and look back and look at the warpath that I had created, and for better or for worse, mm -hmm. assess everything and kind of put things into place and. You know, some things very proud of, some things not proud at all. Some things, um, you know, oh man, that's right. I was doing that and then I got sidetracked and I got completely pulled away from that. I got to get back to that. I got to reconnect with the why I'm doing this. Not the how, yeah. but the why. And it really took um, some, you know, the hand of God sitting you down and going, okay, I need you to reflect and I need you to think on yeah what you've done and what you where you want to go and to be honest had i not had that break i probably would have kept going on the path i was on which wasn't a bad path mind you i just sometimes you get so caught up in the motions of going through the the running and and the and the yeah i've got to get to this that gig this thing oh i it's promised that the schedule the thing that you just get into the the dance of it and you forget yeah. the why am i dancing this way why right. am I, why do i have why am I even here? What is the whole point of all this? And um, it was a very sobering moment for me, very scary moment too. Like to to yeah. to you know to also realize like oh shit, like maybe it's done, maybe we're done, maybe this is where it stops. That was a fucking great mm -hmm. run, man. You had a great yeah. run. Be grateful, yeah. shut up, and just you know count your fucking winnings and go sit in the corner and process. <laughs> right. Um, and so there's a lot of that, you know, it's like, should I hang it up? But I, um, through that, I, while most people were taking a break, I had a little window, maybe three, four months of a window where I was like, this is, I, I, I figured it all out. I assessed and put things in the places that they needed to be. And then I sat there, I was like, what's missing? What's missing now is I feel like after doing something for 33 years, like the shoemaker, right? I was like, I make shoes. That's what I fucking do. <laughs> Right. You know, all of a sudden I'm not making shoes. I don't, I, I don't, I need people to have shoes. It's, it's this connection I have. So I was like, I need to be able to make people feel good, especially in these weird times. So I started streaming and the streaming thing turned into a whole other world. And I was doing it once a week. And I'm, I'm not just like playing some records and standing around drinking coffee. I was putting together like festival level sets. Yeah with just and and dumping all my energy into it because i was seeing that other people were out there needing to receive and needing something yeah, everyone was sort of like sure. floating so i realized that my doing my playing music for people was giving people a um a lifeline and that yeah, gave absolutely. me a lifeline and, and also reinforced the why and in a major way made me reconnect with my fan base and, and it was also an interesting filter because two things had happened, three things actually. One, it brought everybody who wanted to be there there. You know what I mean? Sometimes yeah. when you play a show or, or play a thing and you're in the and you're playing and you're looking around the room, like half these people could give a fuck to even be here. <laughs> They're just right. here for whatever, you know. It's like the people who were there were there and were were a hundred percent present. And that was yeah. warming because it was like, oh, I can just do we can just have this interaction second yeah. um because we weren't in a club or in an atmosphere where i had to make you dance or or you know in an environment where someone's like hey man we need to fucking we need to have you need to hit this benchmark of you know people through the door or sell this bottle or whatever the bullshit you know agenda is behind them besides the music which is yeah. what we're all there for um right. it took all that away and so and it was, it was, everything was flipped. So instead of like, 
I remember seeing certain DJs go in and start playing like they were still at the club. And I was like, that's cool for people who want that. But I felt like people, it was the opposite. Like people are now sitting on their couches, like chilling, watching. And so you could play music. You could dig into your bag and play some stuff that's really like heady or groovy stuff that you'd play only at an opening set or stuff that you would never play at all. And people were like, yo, what is this? Because people were just wanting to connect. And, and if it gave them a vibe or a feeling, they could finish that stream and close their laptop and be like, yo, I feel like, like I went to church and music has a power to heal. So I was here and like all this music that I was playing to heal myself, I started playing for other people and it allowed, it just, it just opened up this whole other thing. And then the last thing, sorry to be on this tangent, man, but the last thing that was really amazing for me was uh, something that, you know, as a DJ, putting it all together live, very technical, very hands-on. It's like, if you know, if you're, If you're doing some incredible fucking shred and you want everyone to see you doing this thing because it's so like, that's Eddie Van Halen level shred. Like, oh, (laughs) that guy knows how, you know, like you want people to know that I did all this work and, you know, it's something that you care about. And you know that there's very few people who tap into that, but those who do, you want to show that because you're you're upping the craft and you're wanting to, to push that. So... Sure. There was this level for a long time where in the DJ community, it became less and less about the how and the what you were doing and more about the, the spectacle or the pyro or the lights or the, or the overall wow of it where sure. people were you know going to see a Cirque du Soleil level event as opposed to an acoustic performance where you're like just locked in. So yeah. When streaming happened, it was us in front of a camera. And I noticed this when I did um, a rave, uh, a, 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 an online rave, like, a, you know, Pasquale from Insomniac, the guys who throw the biggest festivals in that, in that world, EDC and Nocturnal hmm. Wonderland and on and on. Yeah, right. Um, you know, OG LA rave dudes. Uh, when Pasquale hit me up, he's like, hey, man. I want you to do a rave. We're doing a, a thing in, in, um, in trying to keep people, you know, sane. And I was like, okay, well, what do you, what's the deal? He's like, well, we're going to do a, a virtual rave. And they took their office um, waiting room area and converted yeah. it into a studio. And they had a set of, of CDJs and they would have a, a DJ come in, play, and then exit out the other door then someone would wipe down the stuff and then the next DJ would come in and play and then they'd exit. And that's how they were doing these virtual raves. And so wow. um, I'll try and make this quick, but it's, 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 it's a very important thing to, to, because it mattered to me. It was also sort of a big shift. And I think it's, I'm carrying it into everything I do now, but um, he'd asked me to do this and I was like, well, cool, I'm down to do it. But I, you know, I use turntables, so we got to figure out how to set up my turntable, my gear. Um, yeah because I don't use CDJs and he's like, okay, we'll figure it out. So I was on the phone with the tech guys. And again, all makeshift, everyone just you're putting their time in one camera, you know, maybe handheld, whatever, but like, it's, it's, this is not a festival that you would walk into and have 18 stages and yeah. it's one, one right. environment. Right. So we figured out how to do it. And, uh, and then they're like, well, the guy was like, listen, I don't, we don't really have hands that could turn this stuff around. So we might have to have you start it. And I was like, Oh, so I'm starting like, you know, and the mentality of you work your whole career to not be the opener, but to be the headliner. And so (laughs) I've gotten to that level of like Coachella level headlining and, 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 you know, Lollapalooza and, you know, whatever, right. Austin City Limits, all these benchmarks, you know, Big Day Out, yeah. Australia, you get to these parts where you're like, you've leveled up. Now I'm opening the fucking thing. I was like, oh, yeah. okay, all right, <laughs> fine. And then two days before I'm talking to somebody and they're like, so you got the memo about doing the old school set, right? And I was like, wait a second, what? Now I'm, now I'm the fucking old guy doing the old school set opening this thing i'm like 
<laughs> you know, this is not what I signed up for. And like, you know, and keep in mind, I've been working on new music. I, and at the time I had just, uh, a song was coming out like in a week. I was putting a new song out with this a collaboration that I did with this guy, uh, LS Dream. And we did a song called Space Funk, which is really dope. And I, I everyone should go out and find it. LS Dream, all one word, Z Trip, Space Funk. And oh, cool. it's a great, it's a groovy tune, man. It's 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 just funky ass tune. But um that was coming out like in a week. And so here I am, like, I got new music. I don't want to play old throwback shit. Like, I, yeah. I don't mind doing that, but I said, fuck it. Show must go on. I'll do it, whatever. I'm I'm handcuffed to my turntables, so I gotta do this. I went in and yeah. did my set. And, um, afterwards I exited and my phone had blown up and all of a sudden my Instagram, I had like 300 messages. I was like, holy shit. Hey. They had, they had 250 some odd people watching it on one platform. They had another hundred thousand people watching on another, another 300,000 watching on another. And I realized that in the pandemic world, in the streaming world, if you go on first, it's like everyone is re they're bored, ready to do ready. something. So it's Stop like it, the bit. it yeah. was like having the headline slot. I everything right. that is up is down. Everything that's right is left. Everything is you know. So here I was in this situation where I was dreading it, and it actually ended up <laughs> benefiting me in com in a way that was incredible because all of a sudden I had these new fans that were like, "What is this?" <laughs> Coupled yeah. with the fact that they were seeing me DJ, and so they were like seeing the craft happened right. and they there wasn't any distractions of pyro or whatever it was one screen and they were locked in and so they got to see it happen and so everything yeah. that i was hoping for happened and uh, yeah. it was a blessing man in such a major way and i'll tell you one of my favorite comments was in the comments because you know people are like chiming in and like are those new cdjs like all these people young people who didn't know what was going on yeah. um somebody <laughs> said and it was my favorite. They said, oh, he's DJing, DJing. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Right. That's what I was, I was like, because, you know, you want to, you want people to have a good time. And, and, and as much as we're sort of nerds about wanting people to see the craft, it doesn't fucking yeah. matter really to the big scheme yeah. of like, did you have a good time? Did you enjoy the music? You know, whatever. Like, did you, yeah. did you walk away feeling refreshed? Like, but if you get boiled down to like, did you notice my, my cuts and my scratches and the blend <laughs> and the thing? And yeah. like, I want you to know that because I, I care about that, but yeah, it's so hard to do that. It had been so hard to do that pre pandemic because it became less about the, that and more about the, you know, the show and the, and the, and the, all the bells and whistles. And I'm not mad at that, but I was able to go up there. And I ended up giving them a thing where I was like, I'm giving you old school with new school flavor. And that was the mantra. And so I was able to play my brand new track. I was able to play some throwback stuff, but take stuff that was, was old and rinse it out with new flavor. And so it was really sort of like, boom, there you go. Here's the epitome of why I've been doing it for as long as I've been doing it oh, and why they brilliant. asked me to be here. And I basically onboarded all these new fans and, and, and young people who were curious and i love that and it, it was you know it was just full blessing in disguise but i took that away and put that into streaming and moving forward and just realizing like there's a you know every time i was also kind of burnt going into the pandemic like oh man i'm just i don't know nothing's nothing's exciting me anymore and i came out of the pandemic all new faces all new people that were super excited it 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 sparked me up to want to do new things and and so anyway, so again, I put out another song with my homie Ellis Dream called Moon Legs. That's a new one yeah. that we put out not that long ago. But there's oh, all cool. I'm still doing new stuff, still doing my DJ stuff. But that moment, pandemic, was really the it 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 made the why that much more concrete and reinforced and made me reconnect with the young me and realizing that I don't have to do what I thought I had to do to continue my path i can do exactly what i feel there is a, f a fan base out there that supports it i'm grateful yeah. for that 
But yeah. also, if I'm just true to myself, the universe provides, man. The universe will, will put the, will connect you to what it is you're looking for. And I'm a firm believer in that. So sorry for the long Dude, that, that rant, but you talking uh, <laughs> from your heart about that is better than any questions I could have asked. Thanks for well, all I appreciate that, that. That was great, man. And I love what you said about, you know, that it brought you back to why you started doing this in the first place, because you're doing it here. All of us who play music, whether we're DJs or we play guitar or drums or whatever it might be or sing, we've played in, we've played to two people and we've played to thousands of people, you know? Right. I just watched that footage on your website of you playing some stadium with LL in front of like, I don't know how many people, 70, oh, the, the 80, set, yeah, yeah, people, 70, something like uh, that. Yeah. RFK stadium in DC. That RFK was... stadium. So you're wow. doing that and then you're doing a, a live stream at a virtual rave and then you've played, you know, to barely anybody like all of us have. It's but the, that, that, that's, so that's, I, that's one thing. I don't mean to interrupt, but that's one thing you're pointing that out. And it's making me realize that I have to say something. I want to speak on that for anyone who's, who's concerned with the, Oh, I've got to hit these benchmarks. You know, if, yeah. if, if thousands of people aren't seeing me, I'm a failure. It's such bullshit. And it's, yeah. and it's also, you know, if you just do it, eventually there'll be moments where everyone sees everything. There'll yeah. also be moments where nobody sees anything, right. but if you just continue right. to do it, it's really, and I've realized this, this is the big takeaway from all of this is it's about the aggregate. It's about all of it together, the career, the everything, you know what I mean? Yeah. If you were to balance out all the people who saw you, what's the a average amount of people in a setting? Well, I've got some fucking, I got some credit. I opened for the Rolling Stones in front of 450,000 people at one point. Yeah. That's great numbers. But I've also yeah. done some shows where tickets didn't sell too well, man. And I had like, you know, 80 people there. So, you and know. that might have been just as fun, too. It could have been just like the crowd was fun. energy, Sometimes man. Sometimes those are even better, man, where you're like, I yeah. got to really work for this, man. I got to fucking get You know what I mean? <laughs> right. So, but the the whole point is getting caught up in the, the numbers game, my yeah. followers, likes, uh, yeah. who, you know, who, who received it. You know, am I worthy enough? Did I, you know, the self-worth, the, the connection to the dopamine rush of like, oh, I got a like, like yeah. all that shit. We all get so caught up in the chasing of that. And I found sure. that happen would happen a lot with also. Sometimes people in the team get caught up in that because yeah. numbers matter to them. I can't get you booked if you haven't sold X, Y, and Z, or I can't. Yeah up you because of this so there's a level of like well yeah that matters and if you're doing great numbers then that's great for your career but if you're not then that's not great for your career but for your creative sometimes just going and doing something because you feel it yes um, had i not done that rave virtual rave thing with pasquale with edc and that whole thing yeah i wouldn't have had those people and i was going okay. into it with such a negative energy of like i'm the opener i'm the old guy they, yeah. You know, fuck, man, I'm on turntables. Like, this is just the fucking worst. You know, <laughs> coming out of, like, the mentality of, of judging my highest with where I was at that moment. And I think yeah. you have to forget about that shit. Every gig, go into it like it's your first. Put your heart and fucking soul into it because you never know who's watching. You never know what's happening. Uh, you, yes. you know, that to me is, is the most sage advice that I could give to anybody is play every show like it's your first and like it's your last. You know what I mean? Right. Like just <sighs> that's all that fucking matters is that moment. And don't not give your best because you're like, oh, man, no one's going to see this. Yeah. Fuck it, man. You know, don't as a DJ, don't, you know, cover your title and like share everything. Be open, be friendly, say hi to everybody at the end of the show. Take as many fucking photos. Be grateful to be in this position. Be grateful that you have the opportunity to share and that you also have the opportunity to receive because it's not just about getting up on stage and giving. It's about standing on that stage and receiving because that to me sometimes is the bigger uh, reward. You know, 99% of the time it is. You know what I mean? Absolutely, so, man. I don't know, man. That's, that's, I, I, I got a real big dose of that coming in and out of the pandemic. Cause once I also got back on stage afterwards, once I was back out on, on the road, 
yeah. I was just like, yo, I'm so grateful that I'm able to do this and that people right. um, are able to, to give me what I need, which is I need interaction as a, as yeah. a performer, you know, performing to an empty room. You know, if there's just fucking one, there's one person there. That's all I <laughs> yeah. need. If there's a million right. people, that's great too. But doing it for not for nobody is is tough you know but well for all for all all the people i mean i don't know a better place to leave it than that today zach and i'm so grateful for all your words um i think people are going to be really inspired but um yeah i mean we do it because we love it and we need to not forget that we're lucky to do it uh if success comes that's great but you got to remember that you do it because you love music yeah. And you want to share music with people and give them that same inspiration it gave you. You have to. You, like you it's not even that you want to, you have to. Like I have to get this out of me. Right. You know what right. I mean? When you're sitting there sometimes you're just hanging out doing whatever and like this melody or this thing or this idea like I got to get this I, it's like it's like vomit. I got I got to <laughs> get it out of me. Yeah. I got to go somewhere and get this out of me immediately or else I'm going to be sick. It's like <laughs> I think you connect to that that and that let that be your guiding light and your yeah. your your compass um i think people tap into that and to be honest i i'll say this as well but for all the fans i've had over the years i don't mind shedding some of that if they were there for the wrong reasons or for reasons mm. that weren't genuine i'd rather have a small core group of people who really encourage me to do my best yeah. and encourage yeah. me to 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 interact with them and have a dialogue with them then i need more numbers to pad it in and then all of a sudden i feel like i'm not connected or i'm you know i'd rather have a small community and i'd rather build that community and have it be what it is and if it taps out at a certain amount fuck it like that's cool too i'm good with that so I feel like that's yes. that's something to be mindful of is don't get caught up in in the snowball. Get caught up in taking care of your community and giving them what they want and asking them questions and being available to them and vice versa. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's a relationship and you and you have to um you have to be there for that. You know what I mean? Because it's not it's not all about you. It's a very much about them. Uh, that's <laughs> that is that is the bottom line, isn't it? It's unless you're connecting with people, what's the point? That's why we're here at Life is Short, man. You got to connect with people and find your people. As a fan of others, yes. that's what I want. I want to I want to connect. So, I think I think that's something too that you know, again, not to go complete, you know, but again, in a time where none of us could hug or touch or see connection really means everything and you get to really reinforce that so i'm i'm coming out of this thing um you know wherever i go with it just in a much more enlightened person and a much better um you know performer and artist i think i'd like to think so um just because i yeah. i i had to, i took some time to reflect and and not really have it be about me and um yeah. i'm grateful for that so any pearls of wisdom that i can share with anybody about this i'm happy to do so but i i'm i feel like uh i'm I'm stoked that you hit me up about this because anytime i can i can pass along the, this this info and hopefully it changes somebody's perspective this is really what it's about and i think more and more people are, are yes. figuring that out you know we're, it's about this real raw thing and that's you know the art the music i'm so honored to have had you on man and i love you and i hope to give you a hug in real in real life but for now Same, virtual man. fist bump <laughs> love you back as well brother thank you for having me anytime oh, dude, all time my pleasure my pleasure man thanks for coming on zach you rule bud and uh thank you we'll, brother we'll catch up in real uh real life soon i hope definitely all right i hope you enjoyed this episode of the conduit the conduit is brought to you by crew s studio and danyubeproductions.com. Many thanks to the folks at Squadcast, Polymash, Captivate, We Edit Podcasts, Universal Audio, Audio Technica, Sure, and Avid. 
Extra special thanks to my brothers from other mothers, Scott Power, Alex Desaire, and Bill Coulter. And last but not least, go check out Soul Picnic, my hand-picked music playlists on notrealart.com. Until next time, this is Dan Uick, signing off.